Hello and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Monica Manley from Academic Impressions and I'll be your host today. You have logged into our session on copyright for online course materials. And by now you should be seeing both Jack Bernard and David Harrison's presentation materials on your computer screen. How copyright and fair use laws apply to teaching, research, and publications is not always clear. The increasing ease of copying and distributing digital materials raises the stakes even more. Educators often do not have access to the resources and support they need to sort these challenges out. Jack Bernard and David Harrison, two of the leading authorities on copyright, intellectual property, privacy, media, security, computing, and cyber law, will lead our discussion on how to apply copyright to online course materials. They have both received acclaimed awards from the American Liberty Association and National Association of College and University Attorneys for their work on copyright. They are both licensed attorneys and law faculty at their various institutions. In today's webcast, they will both walk you through the framework from which your institution and faculty can establish who owns the rights in online courses. You will leave this webcast confident in your ability to apply copyright to online course materials more effectively. We hope that you get value from today's webcast. And we're going to ask you in a survey afterwards to give us some feedback. So if you have any questions during this webcast, webcast, you can type those into the questions and chat box area on the left-hand side of the screen. Please feel free to enter those in at any time. If you have technical questions for me, you'll type those in the technical support box in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jack to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the, to the cast. Um, David and I are looking forward to talking with you all about copyright in the context of online courses and teaching and learning. Our hope is that by the time we're done with this, that you'll have a, a, a clearer sense about how to think about copyright in this context. Uh, because the circumstances are so myriad, we may not be able to answer every question that uh, might come to your mind. So feel free to ask those uh, questions, and we're happy to try to address them either during the context of this course uh, or subsequently after the course. So uh, today, as part of uh, our agenda, we're going to cover two big swaths of, uh, of information. David's going to talk with you about an, a, a lightning speed. It's amazing all he's going to be able to get in there for you. And then I'm going to follow up uh, with a discussion about thinking about rights in the context of online courses. We're going to kick off with a poll, and we'll do two polls at the same time. We'd like to know whether your institution has offered an online course and also whether your institution has offered a MOOC. Uh, a MOOC is a kind of online course, and so we're asking both about general online courses and the specific MOOCs themselves. And you should see uh, some, some polls appearing on your screens, and uh, at, what we'd like you to do is to, uh, to try to click, and you, you'll be able to see what others say, but don't let what others say influence you. It's okay if you're uh, ahead of the curve or not ahead of the curve or somewhere in the middle. We're just trying to get a general sense because it will give us an idea about how to frame our discussions uh, with you today. Um, and I see what we've got uh, uh, some uh, more people have responded to the first question so far, but um, thank, thanks to those of you who are actively looking at both sets of questions. And you're seeing a trend that we're familiar with, which is that lots of institutions have, uh, have started to do online courses but fewer of them have, have uh, embarked on the MOOC path. Uh, these massive open online courses are the, are the rage today. Um, it'll be interesting to see where we are five years from now. But because there is so much participation in these online courses, we thought it was useful to, to get a, a sense of things. And, um, and while we don't have responses from everybody just yet, it looks like we can see some trends here. And it is, it is also possible that uh, folks are having trouble with the technology, um, and if you are, um, you, can, you can query about that. I think at this point, um, it's a good, good idea to close the polls, because we, we now have a sense of what we need, and we'll move on. So these kinds of terms, this menagerie in front of you right now, is just the, the kinds of words, the nomenclature of today when we are thinking about uh, online courses and, and what colleges and universities are, are thinking about in this context. Um, these terms are not terms that were used uh, as much when I was in school and probably when many of us were in school, but the environment has changed. And one of the ways that it's changed is while we're still uh, the, the leaders in terms of generating content, 
we partner with organizations like these organizations that have platforms that help us get information out into the world in new ways. Um, and so these uh, edXs and NovoEds and Courseras of, of the world, our institutions are working more regularly with these organizations. Uh, and this is why um, we, we want to have this discussion today, because this is, these, these folks are new players in, in the field. For purposes of our discussion today, our hope is that we'll think about uh, courses in two big buckets. The first are the kinds of courses that many of us have been uh, doing for a long time, which are online or distance ed courses um, within the context of our own institutions. That is, we, we didn't need third parties other than students to participate in those, in those courses. We were able to put them on ourselves. They were typically taught by our employees or non-employee independent contractors, and they were enrolled typically to, by our students or potentially to people in our communities, say, through extension programs and that sort of thing. Um, and then there are the more modern types of courses uh, that are taught in concert with uh, external parties. Um, and these might be other post-secondary institutions, or they might be platform provi providers like uh, Udacity or edX and whatnot. Or they might actually be third-party content providers, say, a partnership with the National Geographic Society. So we're seeing more and more of these second category of, of uh, courses emerging. And that's primarily what we're going to focus on today. Um, it, it's not that the former courses are irrelevant, so you should keep those in mind as well. But we're leaning quite heavily in our discussion towards these courses where we're collaborating with third-party, typically platform providers. All right, now I'm going to pass things over to David, uh, who will take you on your whirlwind trip through copyright. Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's always a pleasure to do this with Jack, because it's uh, one of the few times I get to be the straight man. Um, but it's worthwhile. I, uh, before I do this, I've got to tell you that I'm going to pack 30 years of copyright experience into about 20 minutes. And you probably will get a little uncertain about some of the things. But then Jack will come back at the end of this, and he'll clarify everything. Uh, he and I have the best gig um, possible, being a university attorney. Uh, the only thing better might be being a retired federal judge, but that's about it. So let's start out with really what is a fundamental perspective. You know, strangely enough, if you were to read um, insides of books or you were to look at a movie or a television program, you'll see you would think that copyright was something that was controlled by the individual and was a reward for the labor. In fact, it's not. It's a constitutional article. And you can see that the real purpose is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And it's giving a monopoly, something that the Founding Fathers did not like, but giving a limited monopoly. Now, uh, Jack and I are, um, I, I don't know, Monica, if we're experts, but we certainly love intellectual property. And I think we both agree that property is a bad way to think about it. What you have are rights. And you can see in this clause the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So what the Constitution gives is a right, not property. And that's important when you start to think about the rights that you have and how they can be split up with copyright. Um, the three basic ideas that we work with when we come to intellectual property are patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And because I'm a lawyer and an academic, I'm going to start with the things that we're not talking about today. The first are patents. And although there are some patents involved, obviously, with uh, writing some types of code or doing the hardware for these types of uh, presentations, the patent right is an exclusion. You're going to see that this is unlike copyrights. You can exclude others from making, using, or selling, or importing some sort of a device. And the patent law is really tends to go towards copyright. And copyright has gone towards patent law in the last 20 years, maybe for good, maybe not. But it's because of chasing technology. Trademarks are probably your institution's most valuable asset. It's the name. It's the logo. It's all those things that identify you. And really, what a trademark does is identifies the source of a product as being um, a product from that particular 
seller or maker, and it distinguishes it. You don't try to um, trademark everything, but in online course uh, code writing, for example, the name Coursera is more important than the code that's uh, supporting it. Copyright is really my big love, uh, which is great, seeing as I'm at a, a conservatory or a group of conservatories. In patent law, you get your rights by registering it, by filing it with the patent office. With trademarks, you get your rights by using it. In copyright, you get your rights by creation and fixation in a tangible form. It used to be that you got your rights through publication, but the law changed. So now, the really the basic is that you can have protections and rights for original works of authorship fixed in a tangible form of expression. And as Jack can tell you, the only thing I like more than the sound of my own voice is quoting myself. And so in a, a syllabus and in an outline, I have written that copyright is a unique blend of political compromise, practical economics, gross misunderstandings, and philosophical theory, all gathered into a complex and frequently irrational statute and body of case law, which is why Jack and I like it so much. What well, the problem is now that it used to be, when I started to, to practice copyright law, it was a very obscure uh, practice. Um, it was done primarily by publishers and by movie and record people. It was not done much uh, in a university setting. Now it is so ubiquitous and it is so complex that it touches everything that we do. And it's not intuitive and it's not always logical. And not only that, but the criminal penalties are such that you could uh, scare a carjacker with the same penalties. Mark Twain, uh, who had some troubles with copyrights himself, stated that only one thing is impossible for God to find any sense in any copyright law on the planet. Um, and he also said that when people uh, gather to write the copyright laws, it's the idiots that assemble. And so now that I think I've scared you about copyright law being complex and all, it really is a basic foundation of what we do. It's a stock and trade of universities. And it is really an essential part of knowledge when you want to go online in any form. So in fact, the playing field is a highly specialized one. And it is one that comes from utilitarian philosophy. And I will um, own up to the fact that I will use this slide in every presentation, even if it's on muffin making, because it's one of my favorite pictures. In uh, about 2011, David Slater was doing some uh, photography. And he says that he took out his uh, materials and he set them up. And then he waited for a macaque, a black macaque, to come along and uh, mess with it. Um, some people have questioned whether that's true. Regardless, this macaque took a selfie. Um, I think the best selfie ever. And so uh, Slater licensed that picture. And sometime later, uh, Wikimedia published it. He sued under copyright. And Wikimedia defended it. Uh, he lost uh, because under US copyright law, the, there is no protection for the sweat of the brow or the individual. And macaques and monkeys and other types of animals, and according to the uh, Copyright Office, supreme beings uh, cannot hold copyright. And so they revoked the copyright and protection and now this picture is readily available for everyone. Now, the, uh, uh, I think the better part of this story is that PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, filed suit on behalf of the macaque. Uh, that case was dismissed. 
So we really uh, have a basic question here is whether or not your institution has a readily accessible copyright resource for your faculty. In my experience, it is frequently in the library, it is sometimes in the general counsel's office, although I find the clearance of copyrights to be much more complicated than actually practicing the law. Well, it looks like a well, numbers are changing, but at least half of you have a copyright resource for the faculty. I think it's important to understand that the Copyright Office may be one of your best resources because they have a variety of circulars, they have an incredible amount of information. And also, your librarians have a lot of information on it, too. Um, the Copyright Office is uh, part of the Library of Congress. And so when you put lawyers and librarians together, uh, there's a lot of um, um, information generated, I think is a nice way to put it. But in fact, the information that you can get through the circulars at the Copyright Office will get you started. And frankly, you can do much of this yourself. And as um, Jack and I will talk, you know, the, the importance of registering a copyright really depends on what the materials are and how you're going to use them. So these are basic exclusive rights of copyright. To reproduce, make derivative works that would be to revise something substantially or to make a movie out of a book to distribute copies by sale or transfer, such as a lease, to perform the work publicly. Um, and at this point, it's a good time, since uh, we were talking to Monica earlier that Jack and I per have performed music um, publicly. Display the work publicly. I have some uh, paintings in my office that were painted. I can display them any place I want. Uh, we have a sound recording uh, transmitted. This is different than the underlying music composition. This is in the sound recording. And the difference between musical compositions and sound recording and the laws uh, attached to those uh, are the basis for an entire seminar I give at uh, UNC Chapel Hills Law School. And then finally, attribution and integrity, but only for visual arts. Now, this is an unusual addition to copyright law. What it means is that I could not deface these paintings or put my name on them because of the treaty that we entered with most of Europe, the Berne Convention, uh, because their copyright laws go on natural law as opposed to utilitarian philosophy. And I guess at that point, I should change the slide, or I will hear snoring. This is a great, uh, I think, visualization of what we're talking about here. So on the left side, the copyright rights are those basic rights that the creator has, or on, in, the, in the copyright law, the author is the technical term for the owner. Then in the middle, we have a fair use. And on the right, we have the use of copyrighted works. Uh, reading a book, seeing a movie, or borrowing a book, those are the users. And then in the middle are fair use. And that's when you take something that is otherwise protected by copyright, and you use it uh, for your own purposes, not just using it to consume but somehow using it to transform it into something else. And so commentary, parody, and then educational use are involved. And this limited educational use is something that both of us will talk about that is not an absolute, is not blanket. Uh, we're always lobbying Congress for a much uh, greater exception and a widening of the educational use. But there's no such thing as a teacher exception. And certainly, when we get into uh, the area of online uh, copyright use, we're very, very careful 
Uh, we use fair use and push it as far as we go, but in fact, we're all very careful about it because the, the players out there who own the content are serious. So the first sale doctrine, you, you have something, you have an audio visual, you have a book, why can't you just put it into your online? It's because the consumer only has a limited right to it. The right to the item, but not to the rights in the item. In other words, you can do whatever you want with a book, except that you cannot copy it and then distribute it. Those are the rights that stay with the author. But the item itself is transferred to you as a piece of property. But the rights, the intellectual property rights, stay with the author. The types of work that qualify um, are, it's really very simple. It's sort of like infringement of copyrights, very simple until lawyers and judges get involved, and then, of course, Congress. It's an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible form of expression. And so if you were listening to Jack and me on a, a broadcast and it was not being recorded, that's not really fixed, and so there would be no copyright. But because this is being recorded, there would be a copyright in this entire presentation, which would include the textual, graphic, and then also the audio works. And this is in itself, obviously, an online course. But look, I have um, taken pictures all throughout here and posted them. So uh, keep that in mind as to why I could do that. Um, and al also, what a great line. I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Um, I'm going to do that someday. So original works of authorship. This original um, is not subjective. There was a great uh, convergence and then divide with how original a work had to be to get copyright protection. There was an uh, entire group of judges who created the subjective aesthetic form as a bar or as, a, as the threshold to get copyright. And then another group that said, no, it should be very minimalistic. We should not do these sorts of subjective um, assertions over art, uh, which is interesting because uh, the, the um, copyright holders of all the interpretations are judges and lawyers, and except maybe uh, the lawyers that are, are at conservatories, uh, we shouldn't be talking about what's good and bad. It was all decided um, by the Supreme Court uh, by no less than Oliver Wendell Holmes back in 1903 when there was a, a commercial case. It was a circus poster that was used uh, by another publisher to create these posters for the same circus, and they sued each other. And the Supreme Court said, you know, uh, it's just a minimal creativity. In other words, it just can't be a copy in order to get copyright protection. And when asked about, well, what about the progress of science and the useful arts, uh, Holmes's response was, look, it's got market value, therefore, it's progress. And if somebody wants to copy it, obviously it has some sort of value. These types of works qualify literary, musical works, uh, including lyrics, dramatic works, including music. And you have to remember when it comes to copyright law, a, you know, a symphony has different rules than an opera. Um, and that's just the way copyright works. It gets parsed and parsed and parsed. Also, pantomimes and choreographic works uh, here at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, our choreographers use several different types of notation for steps. Pictorial, graphic, sculptural works, motion pictures, sound recordings, architectural works, computer programs, and you all sleep better tonight knowing that copyright can also protect boat hulls. The terms of protection are a problem. And there are maybe seven people who really understand all the terms without having to uh, sit in front of a sheet. Um, I'm not one of those seven. Uh, the law began 
back in 1790, protecting only books, maps, and charts, and protected them for 14 years. Now, the copyright protections are the life of the author plus 70 years, or 120 years from the creation for a work for hire. That's different than 14 years. In fact, what it does is it has locked up the um, vast majority of content that we have into copyright scheme. The public domain is where the rights go when the copyright statute no longer applies. And the reason that it's in public domain is that back before the law uh, changed, which we'll talk about, there was no notice, there was no uh, publication or registration, or the copyright expired, something that uh, we don't see much of these days, or protection wasn't available. The United States government works uh, do not get copyright protection. It's a long time, and not only that, but it's automatic. You don't have to do anything other than fix your work in a tangible form. I have a phono record here, but it, it could just as well be anything. It could be your notes that you're taking. These are expressions of your ideas. The ideas are not protected, but the expressions certainly are. And they're fixed if you're writing them down or putting them into a computer. That makes a presumption. A presumption, this is probably the biggest takeaway. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that you have to assume that whatever you're using is copyrighted, regardless of any notice, regardless of any registration. You just have to assume it's copyrighted. So these are the basic copies recognized under the copyright law. So you have the copy, which is, say, a book, a phono record, which um, how many of you still have phony records? I guess they, they are coming back. And I still have a box that I've moved at least 12 times full of uh, vinyl. And then audiovisual, what this is. And you can combine those. So no formalities. You don't have to put notice. You don't have to put the C circle. You don't have to register. You don't have to publish. But if you do put your formality on it, this is the formal way to do it. C circle, or the word copyright or abbreviation, the year of first publication, and then whoever owns that work. It's also really important that we talk about authors and ownerships because it's different in higher education, or at least in most schools. The author is a term of art, meaning that the author is the owner of the rights. And that author can be generally the creator or the entity that employs the creator or commissions a certain type of work for hire. You would think that when you hire a photographer to come in and take pictures of your um, faculty party that you own the pictures, but you don't. Um, the photographer does, because it's not one of those types of materials that you can commission, and the photographer is not your employer. Now, you can get an assignment, which is very important, but those rights are going to stay with that photographer. So the work's made for hire. Usually, if you're an employee, the employer is the author, not the creator but the author. And so you own that right as the employer. As we'll see, it's not that way in most of higher education. But it's a very important part of the copyright law. And it's important because there are some special provisions for terminating a copyright. I write a comic book, and it's got this Superman in it. And I sell it to some publisher for $200. And then 35 years later, it's a, a multi-billion dollar industry, and I got a couple of hundred bucks. Well, the law now allows me, after 35 years, to go back and revoke that copyright, uh, or probably more accurately in, in a practical sense. I can go back and tell the publisher I'm going to revoke it, and the publisher can pay me off. But that doesn't work 
if the uh, material has been a work for hire. And that's important because when you can have this type of termination taken away because it's a work for hire, then it makes everything more secure for at least the owner of those rights. An assignment is different because the assignment, which you'd get from that photographer, is what could also be revoked. So in higher education, most higher education institutions waive the work made for hire for faculty. Not all. There are some who, in fact, uh, keep the work for hire employer uh, provision in their policies. At the University of North Carolina, for the whole system, we do not uh, take faculty works uh, under our copyright. We sure do the patents. And we have to do some sort of different things uh, here at the School of the Arts, uh, especially when it comes to the performances and the creations we do cross-disciplinary and almost everything we do is a joint work. We will take an exclusive license in something that has been created as part of a production, the exclusive license of all the joint owners, whether it's faculty, students, or outsiders. And we will take that license to prevent one of the joint owners from using it and exploiting it, because a joint owner can. And then they just have to account for any money made. And that helps us in, in that way. And I think that other universities can use that too. So the reason that most higher education has done what we have done here at the University of North Carolina is because publication is part of tenure and promotion. And Publication requires copyright transfer. It's easier for the, um, the writer of the manuscript to transfer it. And because publication is usually a condition of promotion and tenure, there's nothing that we should do to stand in the way of it. And frankly, academic works are not monetarily very valuable, unless you're selling journals to the library. And I'm sure there are some librarians on, uh, online today who uh, feel that pain along with me. And then also as a matter of academic freedom. So these waivers will be in your policies uh, generally. Now, there was a case in Kansas in which the court held that uh, even if there's a policy about it, uh, it's not a mandatory subject of collective bargaining. And I don't know how far you could use that case by saying the university really always owns it. I wouldn't push it very far myself. Again, registration is not required. It is required to file an infringement suit, and it helps in all sorts of damages, especially attorney fees. And the willful damages, uh, such as $150,000 per infringement. But this is something that you can do fairly easily. And it is something that provides great protections. And as you'll recall, I said that the Copyright Office has great materials. If you go to the Copyright Office and you look up circular number 66, you'll see like a four-page explanation of how you register an online work. And so I highly recommend that you do register these courses that you make because it's not that expensive and it provides great protection. And it also helps you to establish ownership and also makes it a very real thing for both faculty and for administration to know that you're doing something serious here. And you're telling the Copyright Office that you have sufficient rights to have this course. So Steamboat Willie, um, because of Disney's position on copyright and infringement and all, I like to use uh, Disney uh, graphics anytime I can. Um, I obviously believe that this is fair use. I believe that what I'm doing is I'm taking this uh, Disney uh, material and I'm transforming it into something to talk to you about uh, the basics of fair use. So this is uh, in the statute. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research, and of course parody. Those are all fair uses. 
But let me go back to this Mickey Mouse and talk about fair use and transformational use and how the world has changed considerably, especially when we're talking about the um, essence of building upon other works. And as I tell my students, there are very few original works in this universe we live in. And frankly, I think you'd have to go to a psychiatric hospital to find an absolute original work of the human mind. Everything else builds on something. So in 1911, there was a song, a popular song, called Steamboat Bill. And about 15 years later, Buster Keaton made a movie named Steamboat Bill, using the basic theme and going along from there. Well, um, when Walt Disney lost his rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, he created Mickey Mouse, and this was a 1928 debut, um, and it is building off the movie Steamboat Bill. I can tell you that there were no rights purchased or licensed for that. And so the current uh, attempt by many of the big content owners to lock down parts of culture and parts of information is, I guess, ironic. There are four factors, and these are four factors that can save you considerable time and effort, and if you're a private institution, considerable money, or an individual, considerable money. When you go to look at whether or not you can use something, you look at the purpose and the character of the use. What is the purpose of it? Is it for educational work or is it for purely commercial? Look at the nature of the work. Is it highly, highly creative or is it a list of names in the white pages of a telephone book um, for those of you who are old enough to have actually seen a telephone book. The amount and substantiality of the portion. That is, how much of the original are you taking? And what is it? Is it the heart of the work? Or is it just something inconsequential? And then finally, the fourth factor is, are you just using this instead of licensing it? What, what is the potential market? This is a really important point, too, for us, is that there is a good faith fair use defense for higher education in which there could be no money damages if there was infringement. But what it presumes is that you have run the fair use factors. And if you have and you're wrong, you can still get the defense. Public institutions have 11th Amendment sovereign immunity but that's not the sort of thing you want to talk to a lot of people in your faculty about because uh, immunity is a bad thing for them to think that they have. There is a face-to-face -face teaching exemption in the copyright law, and it exempts displays and performances when it's in a classroom. And if it's an audiovisual work, it can't be pirated. It has to be lawfully made. But you'll see it's only displays when you put up a picture, and performances, when you play music or you play a movie or something like that, does not cover copying of text. There's also the TEACH Act, and you would think with a name like the TEACH Act, it would be great. But what it does is it shifts over some of those fair use rules online. So it permits, again, performances and displays with limitations only for students officially enrolled in a course, which leaves MOOCs out for the most part. And if you get it wrong, it's a problem because there are both civil and criminal penalties. One song downloaded illegally from the internet is $150,000 in fines, uh, $30,000 statutory damages, any profits if it's commercial, and of course, uh, my favorite part of the law is you get attorney fees. So we have a poll. 
how does your institution's intellectual property policy address ownership of online courses? Um, I like the honesty of the not sure group. So generally, institution, about a quarter of you, uh, depends on resources, is uh, also that's kind of really interesting split we have here. So some of the institutions automatically own. Some allow the faculty to automatically own. Some take into consideration of resources. Um, and interesting about 10% doesn't address, which is not unusual. So OK, that, uh, that does give me a good idea. Ownership policies differ from place to place, obviously. And in, uh, at the UNC, we have our ownership policies that are pretty standard, pretty typical. And they do ownership by who you are and what you do. So faculty ownership is different than a student or staff. The traditional faculty works are those that we think of. Um, you know, I think of journal articles and books, although where I am um, at the School of the Arts, it's very often plays and it's uh, compositions and movies and things like that. Directed works are those where the, the dean says, I want you to create this course. And I want it to be an online course. What we say at UNC is, you, the faculty, are giving us the rights as the uh, author in this course. But there has to be a clear written agreement stating that. It can't just be an offhanded comment. Because we still presume that the faculty is going to own. The exceptional use or the substantial use is something that we all came up with in the late 90s when we were all going to become multimillionaires selling our courses through distance education, which strangely enough didn't happen. Um, the, the difficulty with um, exceptional use is that back in the late 90s, to create an online course truly took a group of graphic designers, IT specialists, um, internet specialists, and code writers. Now you can do it on a laptop on the beach. And so the exceptional use is something that many schools still have in their policies, but they don't use it. Student works, again, um, as I said, we retain a right to joint control. But once that right to joint control ends, which is when the last student graduates, and they are not going to use it to enter into a competition or something, then the rights revert back, and we let them fight it out. We do treat staff works, most universities do, as a typical work for hire. We don't give that exemption to our staff members. The institution is the author. Grants and uh, sponsored works will generally um, have it right in the uh, agreement. So this higher education exception, um, I'm telling you that uh, if you want to own the course, that's great. But the reason should be something that is uh, different than money. Now we want to take, I'm just going to blast through this. Uh, it's really for you to look at. When you go to use these works, what you're going to do is you're going to probably license them. These are all names of groups and places where you can get those licensed rights. Because it's going to be easier to license in most cases. And as I say, Getty Images will sue you. You can always use fair use. You can get permission. We do that all the time. And you can still use your library source to get some sort of reserves. And then there are alternatives to consider, public domain, common, creative commons, open source, open education. These are all really important things to think about, especially in MOOCs. And I'm going to turn it over to Jack again and see if I can take a breath now. 
Uh, thanks, David. That was that was great. A lot of information, and you should all feel free to uh, to type questions in the question box as I'm going forward here, either about the things that you uh, heard from David, or you can talk about what you're hearing from me. As you you can see, I was a little uh, prolific. Um, okay, so as we're thinking about these online courses today, we're we're just encountering a lot of newness. Everything is new, 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 new. Um, we uh, we, we've got new technologies which bring about new ways of teaching and new ways of learning. So the experience of people is going to be very different, our, our faculty and our students. Moreover, it's changed student expectations in terms of, of what, they, uh, what they feel they need. The kind of immediacy and interaction that they anticipate uh, is very different than the experience I had going through school. And that's true for most of the people who are teaching our courses. And so getting people up to speed uh, in order to deal with the expectations that come with this new technology can be uh, a jarring process. In addition, there are new business models, not only for what we're doing in our academic institutions, but also uh, in terms of the relationships that we have with other kinds of institutions. So these, there are new partnerships, new ways of delivering this education. Um, and uh, with all this newness, we may be struggling because we have old assumptions uh, about how teaching and learning work. These instincts that we have could lead us astray. Um, it, it's not surprising that we often rely on our habits. Uh, this is what we, we do as human beings. But um, w as we migrate things outside the context of the university, and we do so, or, or our college, uh, we do so um, in ways that may create new kinds of risks for us. Uh, our, the expectations of our constituencies, whether they're students, faculty, or staff, they are going to be challenged by these new technologies and these new ways of delivering education. Um, and we are therefore required to think a little bit more consciously about what it is we're doing. I always tell the faculty I work with, understand, I know you developed this course and you've developed it over the last 20 or 30 years. But this climate is different. It's actually going to take you a longer time to prepare this course for a whole variety of reasons that you're unaware of than it would take you to prepare to teach this course yet again uh, in the lecture hall. Um, and of course, we have to think about the disposition of rights. These are the things that our, our faculty, our students, and many of our administrators don't even think about. But it's, it's what we're going to be talking about for uh, the next few minutes here. So how do you think about the disposition of rights? I have put together this little image to give you some guidance here. Everything has to fall within that circle that is the law. The law creates some, uh, some limitations on us, and we have to be mindful of those limitations when we're thinking about the disposition of rights in the context of online courses. Within the law, we, we've created our own institutional policies. Uh, and we want those to comport with law, but they establish a kind of law themselves for how we're, we're going to make determinations about the dispositions of copyrighted works. Inside our policies, we hope to create uh, contracts that don't transgress the law or our policies. Um, and those, those contracts will help us make determinations ultimately about the disposition of rights. You may, be able, you, may, you may have a circumstance where you don't have a contract, and so institutional policies might dictate. Or you may have a circumstance where there are no contracts or institutional policies, and the law may dictate. Or there might be no institutional policies, but there is a law and there's a contract. So just think about these as concentric circles, and know that you have to uh, pay attention to the circles that are larger than the circle you happen to be in at the given moment. And we're going to go over these circles in a little bit more detail. So the first place to think about these issues is with respect to the law. And you just heard from David a little bit uh, about who holds the copyright. But it's complicated. And um, I just want to touch base on this once again to underscore it for you. So the default rule in copyright is that the copyright holder is the, is the person who authored the works. Or if several people authored the works jointly, then they are the copyright holder. So if David and I. Uh, prepare a book or say a PowerPoint presentation together, we jointly hold those rights together. Um, if, if I write uh, poetry uh, and I'm the only author, I am going to be the copyright holder. 
it's a great rule. And if law were simple, it would be the only rule, but it's not. Um, and so uh, we have to think about circumstances where there might be an employer-employee relationship. This is true of, of all employees at an institution, whether they're custodians or our faculty, although our, our faculty don't tend to think about it this way. Um, that is, they don't want to be thought of as employees. And um, I, I understand that. But um, as a technicality, under copyright law, they are employees. So work created, copyrighted works authored within the scope of employment are the, are the copyrighted works of the employer. So you have one of two situations. Either the copyright holder is the author of the work, or the copyright holder who authored the work authored it within the scope of employment. Those are the two big buckets. There is this sort of third bucket, which can be a little confusing. And those are independent contractors. An independent contractor is typically a person who works for you who is not your employee. Now, it is also possible to have an independent contractor relationship with your employee. Um, and we can, we can talk about that if you want to dive deeply on that. But generally speaking, independent contractors are those people who work for you but who are not your employees. So I will, I will continue an example that David gave just to kind of cement this in your memory. When I was getting married, um, my, I said to my wife or my would-be wife, hey, listen, let's have my buddy Hugh take pictures at the wedding. And she said to me, Hugh shouldn't take pictures at the wedding. He should be able to enjoy the wedding. I think it would be better if we spent a lot of money on a photographer, on an expensive photographer. So we went off and visited a ton of these expensive photographers. And uh, Katrina finally picked a photographer that she liked, and I was fine with any photographer. And we sat down, and the photographer you, you know, slid over a contract, because he was an independent contractor. And the contract said all kinds of things, including that it was going to cost me an arm to pay for this uh, photography. And secondly, that, um, that, that he would be the copyright holder of the photos. And, uh, I, and, and that's true, with or without the contract, because he is the default rule. He is the, he is the photographer. Um, he is the author of those photos. And the employees who work for him, when they take photographs that are protected by copyright, they, they are works made for hire. And so he holds the copyright as the employer. And I said to him, listen, I'm a copyright lawyer, and I'm worried that in five years you're going to be out of business, and he was out of business within five years, uh, and that I will not be able to find you when I want to make uses and ask for permission. So why don't you just transfer the rights in this contract to me? I want you to transfer the rights. You're an independent contractor. The default rule applies to you. I need you to transfer the rights to me. So he takes the contract back. And um, he looks at it, he does some scribbling, and he pushes it back to me, and it says, OK, now it's going to cost you an arm and a leg uh, uh, to have these photos. So I am now, the, world, I am now the, um, the copyright holder of the world's worst wedding photos. They were terrible. I mean, just horrendous. But I hold the copyright because I have a contract that says I hold it. And I have a contract with my independent contractor because at the time I signed the contract, I had him transfer the rights to me, which was, it turns out, um, Maybe a good thing. Anyway, in the end, the thing to note here is the contract can change the disposition. It can change the default because it can transfer rights. And you want to be mindful of that when you think about uh, contracts. OK, how does a person become a copyright holder? It really is very simple. You're the author of the work, or someone has transferred the work to you. It's possible for you to get the copyright by will or by through some sort of bankruptcy proceeding. And there are a few other ways that are very edge cases, but they're typically by process of law. The same thing is virtually true for, for institutions like our post-secondary institutions. Um, and that is, when employees author works, the institution holds, holds the copyright, so long as the work authored with, was authored within the scope of employment. Written transfers can also make the institution a copyright holder. And again, wills and bankruptcy and a, and a variety of other little processes might affect that. But this is how you become a copyright holder, in, in these ways and none, no others. OK, so the, the challenge for us is that when we, when we teach courses, whether they're online courses or any other course, our faculty, our instructors want to use third-party materials, that is, materials that aren't the institutions. They aren't the faculty members. And um, it, it's, uh, it's a very commonplace activity, and we should anticipate seeing it. 
So ordinarily, we have to think about the rights of third parties. Uh, unless, we hold, unless we hold rights, the third party will hold the rights, and we, we may have to ask for permission. But some uses we make, such as fair uses, are already authorized by the law. There are rights. We don't have to ask the copyright holder to make those kinds of uses. Other uses, when, when they're not authorized by the Copyright Act, and, and David gave you some examples, uses like 110 uses or Teach Act uses, um, fair uses, when they're not authorized by the Copyright Act but the work is still protected, we have other options if we don't want to ask for permission. We can make our own. We could try to find another version of the, that little element that we like. Um, or we could seek authorization. I'll tell you, we hire students and um, uh, sometimes we even create staff positions to generate these kinds of works for us. Students love doing this. Our art students and music students contribute to our online courses because we, we either can't get permission from a third party or the third party will charge us too much. We'll have students develop the artwork we need or, or create the music for the online experience that we're looking for. And students really love the opportunity to have a byline. So it's a really wonderful relationship, and we're fortunate to have a, a ton of talent at all of our institutions, and I encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, because seeking authorization sometimes can be expensive, especially in the context of courses where you might have um, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of students in, in, uh, in the, the online environment. OK, so in most cases, it's content providers, like our institutions or our instructors, who are responsible for making the determinations about whether uses, say, are fair uses or whether you need authorization, and to secure that authorization. Um, within the institution, we can, we can decide for ourselves whether we want our institution making these decisions or whether we want our instructors making these decisions. Between us and a platform provider, we might, um, we might negotiate that out in a contract. Um, sometimes our, even our policies will affect these things. Uh, but realize that contracts with third parties, and sometimes even with our own faculty, will dictate who's going to have these responsibilities. Um, and it's important to do so because the, the if there are mistakes, if there are errors, the violations of copyright will, will often um, affect both the content provider, the institution, the, the party offering the course, and the platform provider if, you, if you're working with a third party. Uh, so beyond the law or within the law, we have our own campus policies. You know all about campus policies. You have them. I encourage you to review the relevant policies carefully, whether they're your copyright policies or policies relating to courses. Um, th these policies may dictate who has which rights. They also may tell you about who gets to, who gets to um, determine what is a university or college course, um, who can use the institution's name. They have uh, limitations on the ability, say, of faculty to in engage um, in competing activities. So there may be conflict of interest questions or conflict of commitment questions if, the, if a faculty member wants to do this and generate revenue in another context. So you want to be familiar with these kinds of policies because it isn't only copyright that affects the, these elements. Um, as you know, there are lots of policies, and it, it can take a long time to get through them. I've included the, the University of Michigan's uh, Who Holds Copyright policy uh, for you in your materials. And I encourage you to look it over. It's shorter than two pages. Um, it was designed to be clear and simple, and I, and I think you'll find it useful, and you're welcome. Uh, to uh, use this at your own institution. Um, beyond our institutional policies, we have the contracts. And contracts are the, are the playground of this kind of work. They can change a lot, because contracts um, uh, give us a lot of freedom to change the defaults. Now, a contract can't uh, uh, have us agreeing to violate the law. Um, and ideally, we won't be violating institutional policies. But they can establish a lot about who holds what rights and who can make what uses. Um, and it, it's important to be very deliberate about this when you're drafting your contracts, whether they're with your instructors or with your, um, your platform providers or even with your students. There can be lots of relationships here. You want to be really cognizant uh, of what relationships exist in this context. I actually like to draw out a picture so I see what where contracts exist. Is there a contract between, say, the student taking our course 
and the platform provider. If there is, I actually want to review that contract and see if it contravenes any of the expectations that we have. Um, I want to understand if there's third-party content. Who's, who's got that contract? So you want to have a sense of the contracts for each course that you're teaching, um, and you want, to, you want to be able to see them uh, in, in a collective context, really important for us. The contracts tell us a lot about who controls the content, uh, the content of, the, of the courses. Um, and uh, while we can rely on, on copyright or other laws to dictate this, Frequently, it's going to be a contract that dictates who has control. Um, so uh, remember that even though um, the default in the law may, may dictate who the copyright holder is, there still may be uses you can make, like fair uses or, or the TEACH Act uses, um, that you are your right to make, where you do not have to uh, ask the copyright holder uh, for permission. Um, if someone was a copyright holder but is no longer because the work is in the public domain, you can use it. If it's a fair use, you can use it. Um, so we've got contracts and policies and the law uh, that help us distinguish who can make what uses. Um, a little bit more about the law here. Realize, and David said this, but I want to underscore it again, that copyright is not like real property, like land or personal property like chattels, like the chair you're sitting in right now, these, these, are, these are real property. It's not useful to think about copyright like it's property. Um, it's just treated very differently. It really is more about rights. For instance, if, um, if I am running by your house and I really have to use a bathroom, I can't just go in your house. Even if you know me, I just can't walk in there unless you've given me permission to do that. In fact, if bad guys are chasing me and I'm, I'm fearing for my life, I can't just go into your house. But copyright allows lots of uses to take place without the copyright holder's permission. It's very, very different than these kinds of traditional property rights. And I, I encourage you to keep that in mind. The statutory limitations on a copyright holder's rights are there at the benefit, uh, for the benefit of society at the confluence of promoting progress, that's the Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 that David referred you to, and free expression. Because realize this, every use that is limited by copyright is an incursion into the First Amendment. It's an incursion into free speech. All copyright uses are speech uses. So that's why there is robust fair use. That's why we have these limitations on a copyright holder's rights, so as not to completely occlude uh, speech, even though we do give copyright holders these wonderful rights that David described to you. Um, these rights are reserved for the public. Uh, they're for our benefit. They're, they're not an exception or an exemption or a privilege. They are a right, and they are statutorily not an infringement of copyright. You can give these rights away. I urge you not to give those rights away, um, and, and to encourage your faculty members not to do so. Um, now granted, sometimes institutions want those rights, and that is a place where there can be a schism between the faculty member and the institution. Uh, it's critical when you're signing contracts, whatever kinds of contracts in this context, that you have a good sense of why your institution wants to engage in online uh, teaching and to produce online courses. Um, there are lots of different reasons. None of these are bad reasons. Some institutions are just trying to make money and balance the, the books. Others just want their brand out there. They want public relations. Some are innovators or explorers. Some just want to uh, keep up with the Joneses, that their competitor institutions are doing this, so they'll try to do it too. Others really want to focus on research and improving teaching and learning or trying a flipped classroom. This is my institution's priority uh, for this. Others want to reach more students, and it's part of their mission to get it all out there. To some degree, all of these things uh, more or less could be tied up, but you want to know which are the, the priorities because they affect what the terms will look like in your agreement. Um, if money is, not an in, is, is less interesting to your institution, when, when the party you're contracting with, say a platform provider, says, listen, we want to, con we want to control the research data, um, but we'll, we'll pay you 
50% more than we said we would pay you. If your institution is less interested in the revenue and more interested in the data, you want to know that when you go in to negotiate those contracts. Um, and these, uh, these objectives can affect everything from the pedagogy, pedagogy to the policies um, and the contract terms. So you want to, want to keep all that uh, in mind as you're entering into these relationships. Um, I, I also think it's important to understand what your own institution's culture is. That is, what is the default culture? For instance, at my institution, we no longer say anything to faculty about um, extraordinary resources. It made the faculty nervous to do that, so we got rid of that. And we just basically said, look, if we want to invest a lot of resources in something and think we ought to have rights, we'll negotiate with you. And if we miss the opportunity to negotiate, well, then you'll hold those rights. Well, this is true uh, in, in the online course context for us as well. Other institutions are not willing to go there. And that's OK, too. There are lots of ways to approach this. You do want to understand the culture of your institution. The more uh, your institution wants control, the l maybe the less likely it is you'll get participation from your faculty. Um, you you want to make sure that you, you, it'll, it'll jibe with your platform providers as well. For institutions that are less concerned about controlling the ultimate course, well, it may, it may increase the number of faculty who want to participate. I mean, not necessarily, but you want to think about these cultural elements. Um, your with respect to your relationship with uh, platform providers, um, you really want to use the contract to be clear about who's providing uh, which services and who is responsible for what. These often divide along the platform and content lines. That is, that the, the platform provider will be responsible for the platform. The content, the content related matters will be the institution. Um, it can, there are some tricky spaces in between the cracks, like what happens if a student infringes copyright within the space of the uh, online system, that is, say, in the chat box, and maybe, as, as we had a student do, link to uh, the Pirate Bay or its analog in order to help people get access to books. Who's going to handle that? It's worth thinking about who manages which, which portions. Also, you want clear gatekeeping by, uh, by the institution. It's your degrees or certifications. They're typically your faculty and your courses. You want the descriptions to be accurate. You, you want to control the relationship with the faculty. Um, maybe you want to control the relationship with the, the participants in the course, the students who are taking the course. And you, the, the overall quality will reflect on your institution. So it's, it's useful to think very carefully about uh, managing these uh, these important elements to what a course might be like. Also, the platform's business model, when you're partnering with one, they want to generate money. That's their goal. Their goal is not necessarily to, um, to make the world a better place. Um, you want to think about your contract with them and the terms that are in it. Do you want a most favored nation status so that you're treated as well as everyone else? Um, what about their relationships with other vendors or advertising? What are they going to do with the data they have access to? Who communicates with whom? Who is responsible for notifying the, uh, the participants about the limitations on the uses of those materials? These are, these are elements that you want to consider with particularly commercial platforms. Um, you also want to insist on high standards for things like security, data management, responsiveness when things go wrong. And you need an exit strategy. People always forget about the fact that sometimes things just they don't go well. Um, the romance will end. I assure you, at some point, it will be over. Um, so who, who is responsible uh, for m migrating the course from one place to another when it, when it ends? And um, what happens if you're in the middle of a course when it ends? Will, will the parties agree to work amicably, at, at least, uh, when the relationship ends, in order to get everybody through their courses? What happens to derivatives of courses? Can I use a piece of this elsewhere? Um, well, what about the underlying data? Can I use the data? My institution use the data? Can the, can the uh, provider use the data when things have fallen apart? There are no derivatives in data because uh, data don't give copyright protection, at least in the United States. Um, does someone have to destroy or transfer content or data? How about does someone have to keep it? And for how long do they have to maintain it? Um, for instance, does your institution want some time when a course ends to be able to download uh, relevant data, that kind of thing. All this can be addressed in a contract, and I 
implore you to think about it up front. The same is true for your relationship with your instructors, whether they're your employer or a third-party instructor. It's an opportunity. The contract is an opportunity to establish the relationship for this project, which might be very different than your current faculty members' experience teaching courses in, in uh, other places for the institution. These courses have greater risk and um, investment for both parties. It's, it's expensive to put on these courses, even if the course is one the faculty member has been teaching for a very long time. It's good to spell out who is responsible for what because our expectations are off in this context. Um, you, the faculty members want to know how will this affect their teaching load? Will they get support, graduate student support, release time? Is this something that will count towards uh, tenure? Um, if they do research in this context, will they be able to count this towards getting, say, a research grant from the institution? All of these are opportunities to make this an appealing endeavor for your faculty members um, and one that uh, gets them to invest the kind of time and energy that you want because it takes a lot of energy to get these courses to be successful. Um, I, I can't underscore this next bullet enough. Be really clear about the relationship with a platform provider if you're using a third-party provider. We've taken the position that the platform provider has very little relationship with our faculty member. It's a relationship with the institution. We manage the relationship with the faculty member. Not all institutions have taken this approach, and that's fine, too. And some of our faculty have relationships with these, um, like the, the, the learning company, uh, they, but they have to go through a process here in order to be able to do that. That's not our course. It's just our faculty member doing another course. For most of our online courses, like uh, the ones that we do through our own platforms and through third-party platforms, they're Michigan courses, and so they're relevant. Uh, uh, it's relevant um, to us how they appear, and we want to be able to control that relationship. And, of course, you have to anticipate parting ways. Inst uh, faculty members leave. When, when a faculty member goes to her new institution, can she use this course there? With what limitations? Do they have to remove the block M's when they go to work for Ohio State? Um, uh, what about the originating institution? Can we still use the course even though the faculty member is gone? Can we use it internally um, and not externally? How about the platform provider? Could we still work with the same platform provider even though the faculty member has left the institution? Or could we make a derivative of the course where we use little pieces of your course uh, or we enhance the course uh, over time? Those things are very, very useful. Um, and again, can the faculty member use it offline? Can we use it offline? That is not open to the public. Um, it's just better to handle this stuff up front before everybody is, is upset. I would encourage you to think about a magnanimous, generous approach here. Have your institution um, support your faculty members, the ones who you're happy with right now, who you might not be happy with later. Let them use their courses elsewhere. That, I think it just makes it easier up front. Um, you get more buy-in from faculty who've invested time in developing the course uh, if they know that they might be able to use this resource elsewhere. It isn't for all institutions. Institutions that prioritize different things may not want to take this route, but it does make things a little bit easier if the institution is also thinking about the faculty member's interests. Um, uh, I'm, I'm almost finished here, and I see we are headed towards our time limit. Um, be sure with your instructors that you're clear about who who manages uh, what kinds of infringement emerge. This is also true with your platform providers. Um, infringement can result in a variety of ways. The system can be, platform can be compromised. They could be sharing materials with third parties uh, that where, where it wasn't intended. And perhaps you have a license that allows you to share this with people in a course or in a closed course. Um, and somehow the platform makes it more widely available. Uh, you want um, to make sure that uh, that if you've used something uh, in an unauthorized way, um, that you know who's going to be responsible for that. That's typically going to be the institution because of the platform content divide. Also think about how students might be using materials, as I mentioned earlier. It's best to put the responsibility with the party who has the most control. Um, I, I know not all institutions can use indemnity language. Uh, platform providers typically have onerous indemnity language. Look at it carefully. Make sure that you're only going to be responsible for the uses and choices that your institution makes. Um, that's why I have this here as a, as a caution. And be sure to follow prudent uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act protocols. And I'm going to conclude here with just a public service announcement. 
make sure your courses are accessible on day one. Um, it's a requirement. They must be accessible. As your courses have to be accessible. The platform has to be accessible. Um, we're bound by federal law. Many of us are bound by state law. And it's important to just develop these, uh, these tools in an accessible way from day one. And I would be explicit about it in your agree uh, agreement. All right, thank you very much for listening to me uh, and my wall of text. Um, and now is a time that you can ask uh, questions. And we'd love to be able to uh, address them. I know uh, I, there's been a lot of discussion here. And I, I thank you, David, for uh, addressing these questions. All right, let's see here. Uh, if the faculty do sign a contract to sell the university, to sell the university the course, do fair use considerations for course materials change? Um, is there a higher bar since the creator is selling the course? Um, so it is true that in a commercial context, um, if I understand the question correctly, that, um, that there, there, it may affect the fair use analysis. Now, David and I didn't go deeply into the fair use analysis, but the questioner seems to be aware that, um, that the first of the four factors in fair use does take a look at the context. That is the purpose of the use. And the more commercial the use, um, the less likely it is to be fair use. Now, that doesn't mean that commercial entities or commercial endeavors can't make fair uses, but it can affect, um, it can affect uh, the fair use analysis. Um, let's see. David, yeah, let me jump in. in with Karen, um, the collective bargaining. That was, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember the name of the case. And I do remember it was very factually specific when it came down to copyright ownership um, and collective bargaining. Um, Google is your best source for that one. Uh, but Google's a nice example, right? So you, you should know that Google, uh, on, uh, on April 18th, um, just uh, had the case against it um, uh, uh, completed. That is, the uh, Supreme Court denied cert. And so that case is done. Google is a very commercial entity that digitized millions of works from uh, libraries like the University of Michigan's library. And um, even though the use was um, by a commercial entity, the court was still able to find that those uses were fair uses. Uh, now, they weren't creating an online course, which so it's a little out of the scope here. But I, I just use it as an example so that you're aware that even very commercial entities can make, uh, can make fair uses. OK, let's see. What provisions are put on sites like Chegg, where students upload the content of a professor and then uh, this third party sells the content. There's a lot. There, there are lots of problems with that. There are a number of websites like that. The way they're typically structured is, students can get access to materials. They can either pay for that access or they can upload uh, content into the the database of the of the content service. And um, the students are are or some of them are oblivious to the rights of the parties whose content they're uploading. And so. They upload that content. They're actually telling the entity, like Chegg, that they have the right to upload that, because why would a student read the 65-page terms of service? I'm imagining you don't read the 65-page terms of service for the, the things that you use. And the student just says, OK, if I de deposit these 40 things from my courses, I will get to see materials from other courses across the country that are similar to my courses, um, or, or that kind of a thing. And so this, this system is kind of a symbiotic relationship that facilitates the use of third-party materials by people that are pretty hard to identify. Um, the DMCA takedown notice uh, process applies to these online providers like, like Chegg. But it, is, it can be difficult to navigate their systems. And the number of students who are uploading materials and the number of materials that are being uploaded from our institutions vastly exceeds our capacity for addressing them on an individual basis. For the time being, these operators appear to be able to conduct their business the way they are conducting it. Um, I know that there have been some institutions, and particularly some individual faculty members, who have contemplated uh, bringing suit against these kinds of online lockers. I mean, they're like junk drawers full of stuff. I've, I've looked through them, and it's just the, the databases are just I don't know, it looks like my son's room. Stuff is scattered all over the place with no order. And the poor students have to riffle 
through all these materials. Oh, I say poor students, these are the same students who've been engaged in the copyright infringement to get access. But, but still, it, they, they look like big online my son's closet. Do we try to um, handle it on the, at the student end of it by having a policy against um, doing this for the commercial purposes or to a commercial place, and then um, we handle it through student conduct in sort of the same way that most of us did with um, downloading files um, from pirate services. We, we really try to go at it by making our students more aware. Uh, that's a great approach um, and uh, similar to what we do here. Unfortunately for us, in my experience, most of these sites do not require students to give their actual contact information. So they just indicate that they're a University of Michigan student, but they don't use a University of Michigan uh, contact information. So it's some Hotmail account or you know something through Outlook. And, and we're not able to figure out who it is in the end. Um, and so this, this is definitely a, a bane of the times. For online courses, too, this will, this will also be a challenge. I mean, we've, we have had courses where the students are sharing with each other materials that are referenced um, in the course. So the faculty member will uh, reference material that she's not using in the course, but will talk about it being a good resource. And then the students will communicate with each other in the forums about ways to access those sor sources, not necessarily um, uh, by paying for them. And so we've, we've had to come up with strategies to address those communications. Most of the platform providers actually have ways to contact uh, the student uh, participants. And, um, and so we have been effective in, in discouraging students from continuing those practices. Uh, let's see. Yours, there's mine slide. Uh, what about the resources published online by other universities? Do we need authorization? YouTube video, APA? Okay, I got it. That's, I think, my slide. And um, uh, yeah, so other institutions can be copyright holders. I mean, in, in, we tend to be pretty generous with each other, although sometimes not. I mean, um, you know, it's very easy to get, uh, very difficult to get permission to use Harvard business cases without, without paying a lot of money. For them, uh, but most institutions are 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 pretty generous with their materials, and I would I would just say the best thing to do is to reach out. Post secondary institutions tend to be pretty identifiable. Um, I, I suppose at times it can be hard to figure out who to contact within those institutions, but I I think it's worth it. it it's courteous. Um, uh, while we don't tend to sue each other over these kinds of things. I think there is real value in, in creating the connection. And, and let me say this, too. When you create materials that you're anticipating others will want to use and you want them to be able to use those materials, when you, when you have a copyright notice, you know, copyright University of uh, Montana uh, 2016, or 2016 by the University of Montana, put something under there, there that says, for permissions or questions, contact X email address. Um, Whatever, whatever the email address happens to be, not a person, but maybe an office. And that will facilitate people being able to ask for permission if that's really what you want them to do. Seminole State, there's some, I'm, the world is full of some great fair use uh, resources. I would really start with the Copyright Office. They have a pretty good, straightforward. Um, and then there are centers for uh, fair use. Uh, I'm sure you can find a great summary that Jack has written on his site. You can find it at all the major institutions. And um, even little ones like ours um, have copyright resources. So it's really um, the strange situation where the rule's pretty darn simple. Uh, it's the application. But once you're familiar with the four factors and once you're familiar with some of the, the cases, then you get a feel for it. One and of the, the big essence of fair use is not that you're right every time, but you're using fair use in a fair way with good faith. That is so true, right? You want to be you want to be taking a dignified approach, approach that that doesn't undermine your goodwill, even if you made a mistake, because mistakes are going to happen. People are involved. Uh, it's also important to realize that 
when we are migrating traditional courses um, in, into the online environment, circumstances have changed. What is a fair use in the context of the traditional academic course may not be a fair use when your course is opened up to hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Um, and so this is a, it's a challenge because the, we've got a burden now to think about the course. I've, I've been teaching now for over 20 years. And um, I look at slides I have. And actually, I have even overhead slides. That's how long it's been. Um, with those overhead projectors. And sometimes I, I can't remember where it is I got the thing that I had there. Um, when you had an audience of 40 in a small context, the argument for fair use was stronger, and the, the chance of a problem was stronger. Um, when, you're, when you're making it available to millions, um, then both of those risk factors change. And so, a, a real challenge for us is that migration process from the traditional course to the online course. And it's really where we get a lot of use out of our art and music students. Um, a question about captioning videos. I guess the answer is a good uh, legal one. Uh, it depends. There are some very specific provisions for captioning and for making materials accessible. Um, because of certain disabilities in both copyright law and other laws. So it really comes down to what you're making the, or doing the captioning for. Um, because captioning is a form of a derivative work. Yeah, let me just say that in um, the, the first case to uh, address this matter um, was against my university and, and several others in the Authors Guild versus Hottie Trust case. And um, uh, we are absolutely allowed to uh, caption video. Um, the online context is, um, uh, shouldn't affect things here. That is, if you can show the video online, um, either because you have a license or it's fair use, um, you will almost always be able to caption it or to enable captioning. Um, some, some systems uh, uh, automate. Um, and let me say that if you are going to be showing video in your courses, you should caption it. In fact, you should caption the whole course or make it, uh, make it at least have the ability to have a caption plane um, that someone can turn on so that they're able to, to see that content. That's, that is a growing expectation of our institutions. Let me assure you, the National Association of the Deaf takes this very seriously. They've gone after the big boys of Harvard and MIT already. Um, and they know that Harvard and MIT have the capacity, the resources to fight. Um, and I think they're working out an arrangement. The Department of Justice has spoken about this. Caption your courses. Um, day one, have them, have them ready. Yeah, what, what Jack is saying is absolutely right. And we can take our copyright hats off and put our general counsel hats off and say, you, you really have to take accessibility to these courses to a very high level. And I think the term that I like is you've got to bake it in right from the beginning. Um, are there, were there other questions that we had missed? Um, I didn't look at the chat at all while I was talking. I was so interested in the sound of my own voice that um, I was distracted. But I, I want to make sure that we got to things that we needed to. And if we didn't get to your question or you have questions later on, you can uh, email us. Uh, directly. Um, you can see the email on the screen right now. You can email academic impressions or, or communicate with them, and they will get the questions to us. And we're happy to share our answers. All right, guys. And it looks like you did take care of all the questions. I was trying to keep up with it on my end as well. Uh, so fantastic job today, guys. I uh, just want to thank you, David and Jack. And I want to thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to our audience today. Uh, let me let you know a couple of things that you can expect to receive from Academic Impressions in terms of follow-up from this session. Uh, we're going to be sending you a feedback email this afternoon uh, with a link to the follow-up survey asking about your experience today. The link to that follow-up survey is visible in the meeting room right now and will also open in your browser window as soon as we close out. Please take a moment to provide us with your feedback. We will also be sending you a second resource email in the next seven to ten business days. 
This email will offer everything related to the session, including a copy of today's presentation materials, the slides, and the resources. As an AI Pro member, you will have access to this recording for the duration of your membership, and it will be in your training library within the week. If you're not an AI Pro member, you will have access to the recording for 60 days. This concludes today's webcast. Thanks again, David and Jack, for an informative presentation, and thanks again to our audience for your participation today. I look forward to seeing you at future academic impression events. We will now close out today's meeting room. Have a great day, and thank you, everyone.